Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Hey guys, sorry, there are going to be some uh, hammering and, you know, construction sounds going on. Got some shingling on the house. So, uh, gonna have to deal with that. That's fine, though. We should, we'll get through it. Uh, German East Africa World War I Colonial Warfare. Continuing this long countries in World War I series. Happy to do it. Love for you to uh, join the channel if you're new. My name's Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. Original link to the video, top of the description below. Right below that, link to the Discord. Right below that, link to my second channel where I do the non-history related reactions. Alright, I can get past the hammering sounds. I'm a professional here. Let's do it. By this time, a hundred years ago, the German Empire had lost all of its colonial possessions. Well, all save one, but it would cling tenaciously to that one. I'm talking, of course, about German East Africa. Awesome little short intro. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Home is down the hall. I'll take some pizza rolls or some... Yeah, that's good. All right, just be ready to learn, please. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about German East Africa in the First World War. German East Africa covered what is today much of Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi, which bordered, among other colonies, British East Africa, the Belgian Congo, and Portuguese East Africa. So once the war really got going, German East Africa was basically surrounded by enemies. I'm not going to delve into the pre-war history of the region very much, but I will mention Carl Peters. In 1884, Peters founded the Society for German Colonization, a group dedicated to acquiring German colonies. This was the late time of the scramble for Africa, when many European nations were trying to carve out their own chunks of that continent. That year, Peters went to Africa and signed treaties with several tribal chiefs, offering them protection in exchange for sovereignty, and the following year created the German East Africa Company. Now, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was opposed Otto. to Peter's colonial plans and gave him no backing. Bismarck did not want to potentially sour relations with the British and wasn't a colonization fan in general. But when Peters threatened to sell his acquisitions to Belgium, Bismarck and his pro-colonial national liberal allies in the Reichstag gave in and gave Peters an imperial charter. Peters turned out to be an unsavory character to say the least. In 1891 and 1892, he was in German East Africa as Reichskommissar, ostensibly to help delineate the border with British East Africa. But he was brutal to the locals. He took local girls as concubines, and when one of them got together with his manservant, Peters had them both executed and their villages destroyed. Stuff like that. Needless to say, Jesus. this provoked local hostilities, and Peters was recalled. Anyhow, the next quarter century of German sovereignty was a period of frequent unrest and war. At one point, a local tribe, the Hehe, dealt the German Schutztruppe, the protection forces, a humiliating defeat, and the Germans responded by invading their territory, destroying fields and harvests to cause famine, and taking women and children as bounty. The Hehe turned to guerrilla warfare, and the conflict dragged on throughout the 1890s. Between 1905 and 1908, there was an all-out war, the Maji Maji War, during which tribes united across ethnic and cultural boundaries against the Germans. The Germans responded as before. And by the end of the war, an estimated quarter of a million Africans died, as opposed to 15 European Schutztruppe soldiers. Yep. 15 versus as many as 250,000. 382 Askari who fought with the Germans also died and around 10,000 tribesmen during attacks on German garrisons. But 15 to 250,000 for the three-year war and its aftermath of famine and starvation. Then came 1914. Now, in January 1914, Paul von Lettau Vorbeck became commander of the Schutztruppe in German East Africa. He had seen colonial combat in both the Boxer Rebellion and in German Southwest Africa. And when the war broke out seven months later, he chose to ignore the Congo agreements that gave the colonies the option to remain neutral, and which colonial governor Heinrich Schnee favored. 
Let Al Vorbeck's policy was offensives without compromise. He sabotaged the British Uganda Railway and defeated numerically superior British forces again and again. They were demoralized until the fall of German Southwest Africa in mid-1915 suddenly gave the British loads more South African troops to turn against von Lettau Vorbeck. The British also began to coordinate with the Belgian Congolese forces, and in early 1916, Portugal joined the war with the Allies, and von Lettau Vorbeck now had to deal with attackers from all sides, and he had no hope of relief or supplies arriving from Germany. He withdrew to the southern part of the colony, which was great for his campaign of guerrilla warfare. He had switched to this tactic since he could not afford to lose men, and that would happen in open engagements, win or lose. In 1917, he was forced to cross the border into Portuguese East Africa, where his men ransacked the countryside for food and ammunition. His war now became an end unto itself. In 1918, in British Rhodesia, von Lettau Vorbeck learned about the armistice and finally surrendered November 25th. But what was the colonial war like? Well, unlike the war on, say, the Western Front, it was a war of movement. It was also a war of foot soldiers, since the terrain was unsuitable for mechanized or mounted troops, and you couldn't really drag around artillery. So most casualties were caused by malnutrition, exhaustion, and disease. Allied troops suffered 17,700 losses and anywhere from 50,000 to well over 100,000 carrier losses. On the German side were 734 European German casualties of 3,600. 6,300 Askaris, the recruited African soldiers, out of over 30,000. And around 100,000 carriers. Civilian deaths are difficult to estimate, but may very well have been over a million. Von Lettau Vorbeck claimed he could have continued the war for years, but is that really true? From 1916 on, his troops were in terrible shape. They didn't have shoes or anything approaching matching equipment, and everything they did have was from enemy or local supplies. Some soldiers didn't mind going on for years, but many wanted to return to their families. And an important note, von Lettau Vorbeck's comrades praised his style of leadership and his determination. They did not praise him for tactical... Look at that dagger. This Is that a dagger? ...praised his style of... This guy's got, sorry. Leadership and his determination. They did not praise him for tactical or strategic genius. The war in Africa was also supposedly more civilized than that in Europe. And while it is true that German and British officers were keen on keeping things almost sportsmanlike in nature, when you look at, say, the Ascari on both sides, you see that those same officers allowed their troops to commit the worst atrocities on the local civilians. Rape, murder, looting. One shoots troop a soldier had this to say. Behind us, we leave destroyed fields and famine for the time to come. We are no longer ambassadors of culture. We are bringing death, pillaging, and empty villages. In fact, local civilians were often forced to become carriers and not given enough food to survive. There's also the semi-myth of the faithful Ascari. They were supposedly loyal to Germany to the bitter end, and in the future were used to portray German colonialism as superior to that of, say, Belgian colonialism, and to show what a good and decent trade partner Germany would be to newly emerging nations later in the 20th century. It's not the uh, highest bar when you're comparing yourself to Belgian, Belgium, uh, African colonialism. But it's each time I learn about how much they, uh, these African uh, nations and the uh, native Africans just got brutally uh, treated. It's it just it's one of those things that just it never. It's like usually things you can get, you know, desensitized to, but every time it's just like, wow. Like, the, that story with the guy uh, having this this girl, I, I, don't, I don't know if she was even, she was, I bet you she was pretty young, too, and then she getting caught with another, one of his servants, and then him just killing them, and then 
all of their village. It's just, it's, it's, it never is not amaze me. Tree. Askari were often recruited from other parts of Africa to make them more dependent, but they were given decent regular salaries and relatively free reign. Things like alcohol abuse and polygamy were tolerated by British and German officers to promote goodwill. And since Askari were used to commit atrocities, in many cases, desertion would mean retaliation. So it was safer to remain with the battalion. Still, there was an 18% desertion rate. Of course, there were many thousands of Askari who were simply loyal to the end, but it is a far more complicated situation than it seems on the surface. In fact, you could say that about the entire situation of German East Africa during the First World War, that it was far more complicated than it may seem on the surface, or that it may seem from stories and legends told about it afterwards. Well, today was just a brief look at the colony and the war, as well as a short analysis of some of the questions and myths surrounding it. As always, I urge you all to look this up for yourselves to get more detail and a better perspective of things. If you want to learn more about the topic, we did do a bio on General von Lettel Vorbeck himself. You can check that out right here and hear me curse during that episode. True story. Let us know what other colonies you're interested in so we can start our research on those. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Awesome. Awesome uh, video. I'm, I love, you know, getting into a series, a long one that I'm uh, very curious about. And so it just makes it that much more enjoyable and makes me want to react to them that much more. Awesome. Um, I definitely don't like when you when I think about World War One. I, I love how they're getting into subjects that I I don't often associate with it, and uh, knowing that these these wars battles going on in Africa over you know trade routes or resources, labor, um, more soldiers, whatnot. Very interesting. Great, awesome. Um, I will be. I will. What am I doing next? Hold on. Hold it. All right, I'm doing the Battle of Badr. A History March video. Love History March as well. Another great channel. Hope you all are doing well. More uh, videos in this series coming soon. See you next time.